Davis. I am Tripti, a very bad educated on an academy. I am a final year computer science engineering student. And in this lesson, I am going to talk about something which is a very integral part of all of our lives. What is that? That is the internet. So if you know, uh, if you want to know more about internet, when uh, it came into picture, how it evolved and what it is today, do watch this video, share it with your friends and don't forget to follow me on the Unacademy platform. Thank you. Hey guys, welcome to the lesson number 6 of this course where we will be learning about something that's basically as much a part of our life as much air or water. Right, so I am talking about our very beloved internet. The internet that bought Wikipedia to us so we can copy our assignments. The internet that bought YouTube to us so we can spend hours watching what's trending. And the internet that has made it possible for us educators to reach our wonderful viewers and teach them. I am Tripti, a final year computer science engineering student. I am currently living in Bangalore. So this is our agenda for today, right here on the screen. First, I will give you an introduction to the internet. We will look into the history of internet and how it evolved. Then we'll see what internet is today. And last, we'll learn about the different types of internet service providers or the ISPs. So the internet has uh, revolutionized many aspects of our daily lives, right? It has affected the way we do businesses as well as the way we spend our leisure time. So count the ways you have used the internet recently. Perhaps you have sent some email to a friend or paid a utility bill or read a newspaper online or looked up a local movie schedule on Book My Show. All of these by using the internet. Or maybe you researched a medical topic, booked a hotel reservation through apps like Make My Trip, chatted with a fellow Trekkie or comparison shop for a car, right? So everything is done using the internet. The internet is a communication system, right, that has brought wealth of information to our fingertips and organized it for our use. So we can say that internet is a structured, organized system. So first we need to know what's a network, right? So a network is a group of connected communicating devices such as computers and printers, right? An internet is two or more networks that can communicate with each other. So the internet is a collaboration of more than hundreds of thousands of interconnected networks. Private individuals as well as various organizations such as government agencies, schools, research facilities, corporations and libraries in more than 100 countries use the internet, right? Millions of people are the users of our internet. Yet, this extraordinary communication system only came into existence in 1969. So in the mid-1960s, uh, mid the mainframe computers in research organizations were a standalone devices. So obviously computers from different manufacturers were unable to communicate with one another. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as ARPA, in the Department of Defense was interested in finding a way to connect computers so that the researchers they funded could share their findings, right? And this would lead to a reduction of cost and el eliminating the duplication of data or information. So in 1967, at an Association for Computing Machinery ACM meeting, ARPA presented its idea for ARPANET, right? So ARPANET was a small network of connected computers. So what was this idea? Uh, the idea was that each host computer, uh, they, may, uh, they uh, may not be from the same manufacturer, would be attached to a specialized computer called as the Interface Message Processor or the IMP. So the IMP in turn would be connected to one another. So each IMP had to be able to communicate with other IMPs as well as the host which is attached to it, right? So by 1969, the ARPANET actually came into picture. So four nodes, uh, first at the UCLA, uh, one at the uh, University of California and Santa Barbara, one at the Stanford Research Institute and one at the University of Utah were connected via the IMPs to form a network. So the software called the Network Control Protocol provided communication between these hosts. Then, in 1972, Windsurf and Bob Kahn, both of whom were part of the core ARPANET group, collaborated on what they started to call the Internetting Project. 
right so in their paper they outline the protocols to achieve end to end delivery of packets this paper on transmission control protocol tcp included concepts such as encapsulation the datagram and the functions of a gateway shortly thereafter authorities made a decision to split tcp into two protocols right so first was tcp the transmission control protocol and the internet working protocol also known as ip so ip would handle datagram uh, datagram routing while tcp would be responsible for high level functions such as segmentation reassembly and error detection right so the internet working protocol became uh, as the tcp ip protocol right and we will be learning about tcp ip in detail in future courses so the internet has come a long way since 1960s right uh, so let's look at what the internet is today so the internet today is not as simple as any hierarchical structure right it is made up of many wide and local area networks joined by connecting devices and switching stations i did made a lesson explaining the local area network and the wide area network so do watch them to know more about these now it is difficult to give an accurate representation of the internet because it is continuously changing right and why is that because new networks are being added existing networks are adding addresses and networks of defunct companies are being removed so today most end users who want an internet connection use the services of internet service providers or the isps so isps basically provide us with the internet another important thing to note is that the internet today is run by private companies and not by the government right so um, i just now i talked about the isps so we have four different types of isps first we'll see the international uh, internet service providers so they are at the top of the hierarchy and connect the nations together next we have the uh, national internet service providers right so what they do uh, let's see a figure here to understand the national isps better so the national internet service providers are backbone networks created and maintained by specialized companies now there are many national isps operating in north america some of uh, the most well known are sprintlink psi net uu net technologies agis and internet mail to provide connectivity between the end users what uh, what happens is these backbone networks are connected by complex switching stations right and these stations are usually run by a third party called as network access points or naps so some national isp networks are also connected to one another right uh, by private switching stations called as peering points right and these peering points normally operate at a high data rate now this data rate can be up to 600 mbps right next we have the regional internet service providers so the, uh, the regional uh, internet service providers or regional isps are smaller isps that are connected to one or more national isps they are at the third level of the hierarchy with a smaller data rate we also have the local internet service providers so they provide direct service to the end users the local isps can be connected to a regional isp or directly to national isps most end users are connected to the local isps right uh, so note that in this sense a local isp can be a company that just provides the internet service like a corporation with a network that supplies services to its own employees or a non profit organization such as a college or university that runs its own network now each of these local isps can be connected to a regional or national service provider so now that we know a little about all these four types of isps just look at this figure here so these are the isps that are providing internet directly to the end users uh, multiple isps can be connected to one regional isp and regional isp in turn can be connected to the national isp right and then several national isps to, uh, together make the international isps correct so that is how your hierarchy work so that's all for today guys thank you so much for watching this video Do like the lesson share it with your friends and comment below for any queries or any uh, feedback that you have do follow me on anacademy.com/user/tripti tanvi thank you so much